Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the uh, Logic Colloquium in Gdansk. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Juliet Kennedy from the University of Helsinki, who's going to talk about the mathematical sublime. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you everybody for coming out and listening. I'm actually not going to talk so much on the mathematical sublime, but just the sublime. So, slide. Okay, so this is a paper that um, it's in honor of uh, model theorist Boris Silber. I was asked to um, submit a paper to the volume. It's not my field. I am familiar with a certain period of, of Boris's work. So at first I was very um, reluctant to write this paper. <laughs> but then I, I wrote to him, I've always been interested in Boris. Um, his kind of repurposing of the syntax semantics distinction. So for him, the uh, syntax are the equations, the varieties are the semantics, stone duality, all these things. He's completely repurposed the whole distinction. I've always found that very interesting. So I thought, well, maybe I could get him to say something about this. So I wrote to him and I said, you know, can can you tell me a little bit about your take on the on the syntax semantics distinction. At first, the conversation didn't really get get started. Slide, but then all of a sudden, he um, uh, if you go back, honey, go back. Uh, there should be one in between. Okay, so maybe it's not. But uh, all of a sudden, uh, go back. Yeah. So all of a sudden, he wrote me this paragraph. He kind of breaks out philosophically. So he says, um, as it says there, there are two ways of how we perceive the world, the intellectual words-based way and the intuitive sensory way. In mathematics, we, have, we need to write down a full proof. The second semantical way is to see a picture, mental or graphical, that talks to your experience of the world. This is what's behind the algebra geometry distinction. Um, the algebra geometry distinction, this is, this is like time and space. In geometry, you see the whole at once, no time needed. In algebra, you need to read it letter by letter, but not space. So, so he sends me this paragraph that's just full, you know, very rich philosophically and uh, full of philosophical moves and um, more or less taking in everything that that we think about in, in foundations of, of of mathematics. So I decided to write the paper after seeing this this paragraph on the slide. So um, so of course Boris is talking about this this distinction in a sense the kind of predicament of the mathematician, the sort of existential condition of the mathematician to be caught between this, the words-based way and the semantical way, going letter by letter, syntax, on the other hand, truth, meaning, and so on, semantics, um, inside experience, meaning, seeing the whole at once. So these are really, uh, I've written about this uh, a lot, this idea that the mathematician is sort of caught in between these two, these two poles. So, so there's this binary practice of the mathematician, right? things having to be written down, things having to be done formally and correctly and exactly. And on the other hand, the experience of mathematics is meaningful and contentual and even um, uh, concept of mathematical truth and so on. So, uh, so, but I was struck by this phrase, seeing the whole at once, no time needed. So seeing the whole at once, no time. It is. So there's a temporality here, temporality of immediacy. Um, there's this idea of surveyability. Anyone, if you're familiar with, well, it was actually Hilbert who declared proofs must be surveyable. Wittgenstein, very important in Wittgenstein, uh, uh, in philosophical investigations, this idea of surveyability and, and so on. Uh, but this idea of seeing everything at once, it reminded me of the sublime. And this is an aesthetic category like beauty or elegance or ugliness. 
Uh, it's an aesthetic category that was important in 18th century British philosophy. So in the 18th century, all of a sudden you get people writing about aesthetic judgment, uh, uh, you know, judgments of taste, people writing, philosophers writing, uh, you know, all, all kinds of, an essay on taste. All of a sudden taste becomes an object of philosophical attention in the 18th century. Very, people have, people have, um, people have thought about why, why that is. They think about some kind of incipient industrialization, a kind of, um, forward look toward the industrial revolution and you know, kind of pastoral experience of, of, of nature and so on is, begins to, begins to recede into the past. It's a lot of, a lot of reason. Uh, so, but this word sublime, um, so the everyday meaning of it is not the meaning that I, I want to talk about. This is a philosophical term like, you know, reference or something like, like that. So, it, you know, you, you taste uh, a dish that's just unbelievably delicious. You might say the food here in this restaurant is sublime. That's not, it doesn't mean wonderful or something like that. It's, it's, I will explain to you what it means, but try to, try to suppress your ordinary, your everyday association with, with the word. The sublime, it's, it's such an interesting concept. I hope I convince you it's a very interesting concept. And so we're going to sort of track the evolution of the sublime. Slide? So it, it's, uh, well, there should be a picture beforehand. No? Okay. I guess there is one. Okay, so uh, remember Boris's, this phrase that you have in Boris's um, paragraph. So this whole talk is about that paragraph in the email that Boris wrote. Um, that this seeing the whole at once, no time needed, right? So there's a, there's a kind of, uh, this temporali temporality of immediacy is something I'm very interested in. So Girard was one of these people, a British aesthetician, uh, uh, 18th century British aesthetician who wrote a book called uh, An Essay on Taste. So he defines sublimity as the state in which the mind imagines itself present in every part of the scene it contemplates. So Boris's, that phrase in Boris's paragraph immediately reminded me of this, this um, this uh, definition of sublimity uh, in Girard. It's, a, it's not a st the standard, not the standard definition, but this idea of overallness or seeing, seeing all at once, there's a, uh, so I have a kind of um, side avocation as, as a curator. I work with this American, the estate of this American minimalist. Next slide painter, uh, American minimalist sculptor, Fred Sandbach. So he's talking about, uh, again, we have this idea of overallness. So he says uh, about the paintings of Jackson Pollock. He says, well, I, I didn't really care about the painting. The paintings didn't really appear to, to appeal to me that much, but there was this kind of overallness that I found very stim stimulating. So next slide. This is, um, Somehow in, uh, in the, the LaTeX slide program that I used, they, they were not centering my images, so sorry about that. Anyway, I don't know if you find overallness in this. This is a detail of a Jackson Pollock thing. Okay, so, so this idea of overallness and seeing the whole at once, no time needed. So, but actually this is, I'm starting out giving you a kind of non-standard definition of the sublime. So Kant, Immanuel Kant, he writes the critique of pure reason. He writes three massive works, which are the foundational works of modern philosophy, the critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, and the critique of judgment. And the critique of judgment is about taste and judgments of taste. And the question in what sense are judgments of taste universal? I mean, he wants to show that judgments of taste, like aesthetic judgments, like that a sunset is beautiful or other other kinds, that these are intersubjective, that there's a there's an objective grounding for these um, um, 
and and so so the third critique is is about that but it's very much about the sublime so um uh let's have the next slide so uh the sublime uh, as i said this is the third critique the first critique is this massive analysis of uh a priori a a posteriori judgment the analytic synthetic distinction and so on it's a very very detailed account of um uh well, it's a it's a theory of mind, um, theory of experience. It's it's uh, it's the found foundational work. By the time he gets to the third critique, he's all of a sudden talking about aesthetic judgments and the theory of mind that you find in the third critique. So just in case anybody, I've I've actually went to a lot of trouble to to try to tie the theory of mind in the third critique to the theory of mind in the first critique, and they don't map. The later doesn't map on to the former, so it's very, very interesting how. Uh, but uh, so so Kant introduces the terms that Kant talks about. So he talks about it in terms of a of a, a physical, physical immensity in nature. So think of standing at 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 the edge of you know the Grand Canyon or something, being pitched into a kind of vertigo, right? Into a kind of. Uh, uh, you know, dizziness. The thing is is too huge to take in. So, as Kant put it, you know, such such a such a scene will do violence to the imagination, and it leaving your 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 cognitive apparatus undone. So, so this is the idea of something just being so enormous, the imagination cannot cannot take take it in. So, the way Emily Brady, she's written some two books on the sublime. She's an environmental esthetician. Uh, so she she describes it as uh, follow, so the subor, sources of the sublime response are linked to the physical properties of magnitude or power in nature, but importantly also to the failure of imagination without which it could not occur. So as Kant Kant describes it, the uh, the the sublime scene or sublimity is contrapersive for our power of judgment, unsuitable for our faculty of presentation and as it were, doing violence to the imagination. But it's never was judged to be all the more sublime for that. So, so the more terrifying, uh, the more intense the experience, the more, the more sublime. Um, so another phrase Kant used was astonishment bordering on terror. So there's anxiety bordering on fear, but also somehow pleasure, right? This is an aesthetic category. So the pleasure of being in the vicinity of danger, while at the same time being out of it, and the pleasure of being in, in awe of something. Next slide. So all the time I was writing this paper, I don't know if anybody's seen this movie by Werner Herzog about the volcano couple, uh, Maurice uh, Kraft, and I think her name was Valeria. So they, um, they're volcanologists, and they... Uh, filmed a lot of a lot of volcanoes so here's one um here's one still from there's the uh i think uh, i forget her name the, the a woman you know really quite close to this ex exploding volcano and she made this statement that herzog quotes in the film he's she says i cannot live without volcanoes i cannot live without volcanoes so they were killed Right, so they were they were kind of compelled to get closer and closer and closer and closer. So this is sublimity, right? This thing that's just extremely powerful, in 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 nature. So this idea that um, this idea of you know astonishment bordering on terror, but the pleasure of being in awe and something. Kant calls this negative pleasure. Right? I I think that's a beautiful concept. Negative pleasure, right? Well, positive pleasure is is pleasure in the beautiful. So that as as Kant thought about the beautiful, it brings with it a promotion of life, right? And your experience of beauty is an experience that's very calm, and and contemplative, and and so on. So this is this is something, something uh, different. So I said that the third critique. There's a theory of mind there. So there's the imagination, which is which is struggling to put this scene together 
as a phenomenal unity, one may say, right? It's, you're, you're trying to put this thing that you're in the middle of or in front of into a picture, but the imagination cannot, it's, it's struggling to do it, but it, but it fails. Um, and again, I, I want to emphasize that all of this, <laughs> all of this, because pleasure is involved, it's, it's theorized by philosophers as an aesthetic category. So sublimity is an aesthetic category. Um, another uh, phrase that I like from Kant, he says, the sublime response, the shudder that seizes the human being himself and the horror with which nurses' tales drive children to bed late at night. So this is an aesthetic response. Right? Just like a response to a sunset or something like that. Okay, so Kant, in, in the third critique, he's got two categories of the sublime. He has the dynamic sublime, and this is what I've been talking about. You're sort of going back and forth between abstract, between attraction and, and, and repulsion, you know, fear and awe and so forth. So this is, he, he thought of this as a dynamic sublime. Uh, and then he introduces this, really, really, really strange thing, the mathematical sublime. So here, too, in the mathematical sublime, the, the subject, the viewer, if you, if you like, also has a, the imagination also fails, but not in front of a volcano or a mountain or something, it, in the face of an infinite number sequence. So Kant, all of a sudden, in the middle of talking about your imagination being done violence to and so on and so on, suddenly mathematics comes up. And he's, and he's talking about the mathematical sublime. So, um, uh, uh, again, there's this mixture of attraction and unease, negative pleasure, the mathematician's negative pleasure, right? The imagination just cannot, cannot represent that infinite number sequence to himself or herself as a conceptual unity. Okay, uh, but... Nevertheless, I mean, it, it's, I've been talking about the, the failure of the imagination. There's also this other, this other uh, capacity of, of, of human capacity, and that's the capacity of reason, right? So what happens is the imagination is kind of collapsing in the face of this infinite number of sequence, but the, but the uh, reason comes in, and reason knits the thing together into a conceptual unity, just as in the case of the dynamic sublime, reason will tell you, well, I, I'm looking at this thing and it's not thousands and thousands and thousands of rocks. The thing is actually a mountain, right? So we know what we're standing in front of, or we're standing in front of the Grand Canyon, right? We're not seeing these levels. We are seeing the levels, but also it's, at some point you say, well, this is this is the Grand Canyon that I'm standing, standing in front of. So uh, this is very characteristic of of uh, if there's anybody in the room who studied Kant, this idea of uh, knowledge that comes to you in a kind of suprasensible way, so it's not coming in through the senses, it's coming in, in uh, another, another way. This is um, a, a faculty, so uh, this because of our faculty of reason. So, um, so Kant gives us the correct outcome, right? It's not that we're just we're just helpless in front of a natural number sequence. We do knit the thing together into a conceptual unity. Now back to Girard. Girard was the one, remember, he talked about, he, had, he talks about sublimity and overallness. Uh, so for him, the sublime experience is, let us say, cognizable, right? We can take it in, um, not because of some special faculty, super sensible faculty of reason, but because of simplicity. So next. So here's a very funny uh, next. Yeah, so I think this is a very funny quote from Girard. So he says, objects cannot possess that largeness, uh, which is necessary for experiencing a sensation of supply without simplicity. If you don't have simplicity, the mind contemplates not one large, but many small objects. It is pained with the labor requisite to creep from one to another, and it's disgusted with the imperfection of the idea with which, even after all this work, it must remain contented. But we take in with ease one entire conception of a simple object, however large, 
In consequence of this faculty, we naturally account it in one. The view of any single part suggests the whole and enables fancy to extend and enlarge it to infinity that it may fill the capacity of the mind. So Gyor talks a lot about the mind sort of, you know, stretching almost in a, in a, in a kind of um, physical way to in, incorporate, incorporate the scene. But notice right here is this idea of creeping from one, one to another, right? Remember Boris talks about going letter by letter. I do think, by the way, I mean, mathematics doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? Mathematics is porous to the culture, to the philosophical culture of its time, right? There are motifs which come in, come into mathematics from elsewhere, and, and also it's, it's conversely, right? Mathematics puts things out into the culture. Okay, so this idea of creeping one, one to the other. So sublimity, um, it's, it's not an experience of defeat, right? Or not completely. You're able to move out of it with the help of reason. The sublime, this is something that Emily Brady writes about. It has a moral dimension. So uh, the sublime tutors us in loving something, even nature, without interest, right? even contrary to our sensible interests. So the volcano couple, right? Eventually they they die. This apparently there are these there are these uh, gases and, and and powerful waves of heat. Even if you're standing very far away from the volcano, that that will hit hit very fast, and that's how how they die. So. Uh, um, this idea of being tutored in loving something without interest, loving something unselfishly. It's the moral, moral dimension of sub sublimity. Um, Kant writes about this, this idea that you are in a kind of inferior position, but you also retain your dignity. He talked about being undemeaned and even having a sense of superiority uh, while having to submit at the same time to the natural word. So sublimity, and this is people now, I think, in philosophy, not in analytic philosophy, but, um, you know, sublimity is, is, is very interesting, and it's, it's very much talked about now. It's always connected to power. Okay, so how does the sublime get reimagined in, um, in philosophy as time passes? So uh, I like very much this writer, Anker Smith. He's a philosopher of history. He wrote a book called The Historical Sublime. And uh, so he kind of uh, gets rid of the idea of uh, sublimity being about things of, in nature and, and uh, the idea of being in awe and so on. Uh, he actually um, deploys it in, in, in the historical domain so something like the Holocaust, this is this is an example of sublimity because it's it's too much to too much to take in. Psychoanalysis, right? Next slide. The traumatic experience. So what is the the traumatic experience? So this is uh, an experience one has always. It, it's an experience that cannot be, as Anker Smith. Uh, says it's it cannot be admitted to consciousness it exceeds our capacities to make sense of it and yet we're always returning back to it so it's there's this dynamic with trauma this dynamic of uh, that Kant talks about with sublimity of attraction and repulsion and he goes on and he says right so so in the traumatic experience we cannot integrate the traumatic experience into the story of our lives it remains, we remain dissociated from it. There's a kind of numbness. Um, next slide. So uh, uh, Burke, he talks about this tranquility tinged with terror. Um, it, it's, it's uh, so this idea of being distanced from real danger um, and so on. So he says, I, I like very much, as such, Burke's description of the sublime is less the present, pleasant thrill that is often associated with it than a preemptive strike against the terrible. 
I think we, in analytic philosophy, should write like that. <laughs> um, so, so what happens to the sublime is that this idea of it as being a site of conflict is what becomes, and so this idea of awe and, um, you know, feeling oneself superior in the face of this very powerful natural scene, all that, all that kind of goes, and it, it becomes a very sort of melancholic idea of being locked into, into a cycle. So the critic Leo, Leo Marx would coin the, the expression the technological sublime. So this is about the conflict that arises from holding the romantic conception of the American landscape in the 19th century, seeing that terrain as a kind of paradise while employing the rhetoric of industrial, industrial progress. And I think you can even see a, a trace of this in Hilbert's Ignorabimus famous address of 1930, right? It's kind of laced with the exam language of human supremacy, um, but, but couched in the kind of technological optimism of of the time. Uh, slide. So uh, yeah, the technological sublime is very interesting. Uh, uh, Wittgenstein asks the question, is, is logic something sublime? Or in what sense can logic be something sublime? So here, uh, the idea is to, to uh, think of logical concepts as, as things to be sort of purified and um, analyzed in, in this kind of um, uh, idealized and purified uh, concepts rather than seeing it as embedded in, in, in our everyday practices. So the subliming of logic right, is this idea of idealizing and purifying logical concepts and Wittgenstein's point is that, you know, we lose something. It's not that this is wrong, but that, uh, you know, we should try to stay in the neighborhood of, uh, of, of the everyday, let's, let's say. So, so the sub sublimity becomes a sort of melancholic uh, concept. Um, but again, mathematics comes up. <laughs> so, uh, next slide. So, um, so the idea is, so Anker Smith talks about the positive and negative number. So it's not that in sublimity, unlike in the earlier, you know, kind of original literature on the sublime with Kant, reason comes in and it lifts you out of this, lifts you out of this, uh, this uh, cycle that you're, that you're locked into. Um, here, there's, there's no getting away from it, right? You are locked into a cycle and both ends of the cycle are, are at work. And he likens this to positive, right? With the, if we're working in the positive numbers, we don't forget the negative numbers are there and, and, and vice versa. There's no transcending, right? We are, we are uh, fully embedded in, in, the natural, in the number system. Okay, so um, uh, there's a lot in the third critique about cognition, about mathematical cognition. I think it's very much, uh, you know, it's very important to think about the third critique if we're thinking about, you know, foundational, uh, the foundational con conversation, the conversation about finitary intuition is all about what we can take in, right? And so on, what's a, what's a genuinely constructive proof and so on. But um, uh, so, so thinking again about about Boris's uh, remark are, are not necessarily these foundational issues, but the way that his remark reveals that logic is also a site of conflict, right? A conflict that gets read, I think, into the syntax semantics distinction and a, con a, a, a conflict that keeps logic, makes logic so alive ph philosophically. Next, next slide. Uh, interestingly enough, just as Kant in the third critique all of a sudden starts talking about the mathematical sublime, Anker Smith too. So mathematics once again, you know, serves philosophy as the great example. So um, in Anker Smith's writings, he also uh, has a notion of the mathematical sublime, but kind of domesticated, 
so that mathematical sublimity now means anything in the way of a mathematical uh, unknown. So here's his quote. Uh, and again, this is in his book called The Historical Sublime, right? This idea of how do, how do we make sense of and how do we accommodate our history? How do we reflect on history? How do we understand it? He says, so all of a sudden he starts saying, think of the equation, this equation, this will have a local maximum and a local minimum. Um, uh, before Newton and Leibniz, there was something sublime about the question of where the equation would obtain its local op op optimum and minimum. Next slide. You can only sort of try different values, but there was no adequate explanation. It has been New Newton and Leibniz's feat of genius to reduce what was sublime to what could be figured out, to reduce what was incommensurable to what, to what could be made commensurable, thanks to the magic of differential uh, calculus. So um, uh, I think this is all very, this is just very provocative, right? The idea that that sublimity, why, is there something, did he make a mistake? Yeah, and his cal did somebody actually calculate what sorry okay okay yeah actually yeah yeah oh that's right x factions <laughs> yeah yeah and, and actually one of the referees for this paper who you know this is a completely wrong idea of the history of the calculus but anyway uh, so, so Kant's notion of the mathematical sublime, it's, it's getting, so just as the sublime is, is, um, is evolving into this sort of melancholic concept, the, the mathematical sublime is coming, coming along, coming along too. So, uh, but I think one could, right, set theory, I mean, this is a set theory semester, set theory, I think, is threaded with sub sublimity through and through, right, the large, cardinal hierarchy, the cumulative hierarchy of sets, how do we take it in? So um, in the paper, so finally, and in this talk, finally took turn to Boris's, Boris's work. So um, again, what have we said so far? There's this idea of being overwhelmed by something you cannot take in. In Kant, there's this way of getting out of it, or in Girard, we get out of it in Kant through reason. We get out of sublimity, the sublime response, uh, through through uh, simplicity. Um, I think if you look at if you look at, at model theory, there are these acts of synthesis that kind of structure the mathematical field, right? Uh, a classification, for for example. Uh, the idea of categoricity. Boris has written a paper with Alex Cruz and Andres Villaveses called Unlogical Perfection. Um, so uh, uh, I think that that you know one can one can think about this paper as living in this this um, moving toward this area of you know taming the sublime, if you like. So um, classifiability is right, organizing principles, kind of scaffolding that um, for first order theories. So here is uh, next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So here's Boris's or, or Boris Cruz and Villavesas. A mathematical object of a certain size is logically perfect if, in a certain formal language, it allows a concise description fully determining the. The object. So this will maybe remind you of Girard, right? We have um, we have a way of, of delivering delivering the mathematical field as or parts of it as a phenomenal uh, conceptual unity. Uh, Andres Villaveses, uh, uh, I quoted in the paper, when faced with certain descriptions or statements, we have a reaction of disbelief. Uh, inability to, to comprehend the object and so on, uh, well, disbelief. We seek confirmation, two types of confirmation by direct verification or by a good, that is to say, categorical description of the theory. Uh, 
that supports the statement in uh, question. Um, so Boris even says category, categorical theories are logically perfect, not only because you have a compact description of some intractable field of concepts, but there's a possibility, and he talks about this um, notion of an affine scheme, a scheme. It gives you a way of regarding space as a, uh, 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 that you can paste kind of lo localized versions of itself. So again, this idea that you see you see the whole in any given part. This is also right in sublimity. Girard's idea: the view of any single part suggests the whole. Okay, classification. Uh, this idea of the trichotomy conjecture. So uh, maybe we need another slide. Next slide. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. So here's Boris's um, Boris's uh, trichotomy conjecture. Basically rewriting um, rewriting a model theory in the language of geometry. Okay, so when x is either trivial or it's a vector space or it's biinterpretable with an algebraically closed field. Probably many of you are familiar with Boris's trichotomy conjecture turned out not to be true or true only for the Zariski structures. In fact, a certain class of Zariski structures. Ruschowski had a counterexample there. Okay, so uh, so anyway, what I tried to do in the paper is to, to write about classification theorem and cat categoricity results as, as kind of synthesizing uh, moves, this uh, uh, you know, resisting or dissolving sublimity, structuring an unstructured uh, 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 mathematical domain. Also, if we think about, about uh, Shalaw's main gap theorem, right? So the class of all first order theories falls into two categories, the classifiable and the non-classifiable case. The, in the classifiable case, we have few models and we have a geometry, a dimension-like set of geometric invariants. In the other case, we have the maximum numbers, number of models possible, and they're kind of entangled with each other in a way that makes it difficult to tell them apart. And so to me, this, this, this seems very much to be written in the language of the sublime, if you care to look at it this way, right? Class, classifiable case and the non-classifiable. Okay, uh, next slide. So this idea that logically perfect structures admit a geometry, this is a very old, old um, uh, development, right? Going back to Tarski or going uh, or or before, the idea of, um, of thinking of of meta mathematical concepts or model theoretic concepts in, in, term, in, in terms of what Sotarsky's phrase for this was the mathematical. So here in their paper on logical perfection, they say perhaps the most remarkable feature of model, model theoretic classification theory is that it exposes a geometric nature of some perfect structures. Those structures arise from their logical definition, albeit in a highly non-trivial and initially unforeseen way. So um, uh, again, this is a key development in model theory right, at the moment when the discipline begins to transform its central concepts into geometrical concepts. Um, next slide. So here, this idea of geometry. So remember, the whole paper is about Boris, this, that first paragraph of Boris. He talks about the algebra geometry distinction. So of course, as, as I'm sure you all know, right, there are, uh, and Michael Harris is an example, there's, uh, uh, you know, to, to have a geometric proof, the geometric proof of a number theoretic, I, a conjecture or a number theoretic theorem, that's the real proof, right? The proof from the book, so to say, as Menachem would, would put it. So here he says, uh, there's an important sense in which answers to questions in number theory are widely seen as more natural or conceptual if they are seen to arise from geometric constructions. So, um, uh, next slide. 
Yeah. Oh. So, um, yeah. Yeah, go to the previous. Previous, yeah. So that's Michael Harris. But the idea that the geometrical proof is the real is the real proof. I've heard I've heard number theorists talk about this a lot. Right? The no geometrical proof is the, so um, so. Thinking about uh, again, I repeat this paper being about Boris's beautiful paragraph in geometry. You see the whole at once, no time needed. So, what is this whole? You can ask. What is this whole? that Boris sees at once, no time needed. What is this hole? Right? In geometry, you see the hole at once, no time needed. So what is this hole that you see all at once, no time, no time needed? And I think what, um, I mean, of course, there's a very big literature on the algebra geometry dichotomy, and historically, it's very important and so forth. But I think what geometry brings into the picture is some uh, is some su suggestion of place, right? Not in any literal sense, but in the sense that um, the architectural theorist Yuhani uh, Palasma means in his writings about placeness, um, a site of experiential cohesion, as he's written, one resonating with the inner qualities of placeness in our minds, a constitutive condition for anything to exist in human consciousness. So this is this notion of place. And here's a quote from his paper, Space, Place, and Atmosphere, in this volume on architectural atmospheres. The experience of placeness can arise from countless characteristic and features, right? Uh, but fundamentally, it's a consequence of experiential cohesion, spatial or formal singularity, communal agreement, or meaningfulness of a distinct entity in the physical world. Through constructions, both material and mental, useful and poetic, practical and metaphysical, we create places, existential footholds in the otherwise meaningless world. So this is an architect writing this is my um, one of my favorite literatures. The architectural theorists are writing very, very beautifully about uh, about place. So next slide. So here's a painting of da of a da Kammershoi, Danish Danish painter. I think the painting has it conveys this some somehow it conveys this feeling of place. Okay, so so the thought here or the thought I tried to make clear in the paper. I don't know if I succeeded or not, is that somehow geometry in the mind of the mathematician creates the conditions for this idea of placeness. And, and in, in virtue of that, the mathematician is led toward possibility of concretizing, structuring, internalizing mathematical ideas. I'm sure there's, there's a big uh, literature on, on this. I mean, there are, there are studies, I actually followed up, there are studies on, on conceptual unity, right? There are all kinds of, uh, there's a very big literature on this. Notice that we take places in all at once, no time needed. So thinking of Boris's, right? Places. So as Palosma puts it, we understand qualities of places unconsciously before we have had any chance for intellectual evaluation or understanding. So place is something you take in all at once, no, no time, no time needed. Um, yeah, again, uh, and, and this is this idea of atmospheres, right? We have, there's a lot going on <laughs> subconsciously that uh, we, we, don't, we don't take. take. So geometry, in some sense, I tried to suggest in the paper, sort of functions in a, in a similar way as a kind of architecture that has this has this uh, it, it has this way of grounding the mathematician in the mathematical field and enabling the possibility of some kind of lived mathematical experience. And so here's my ontological question: You speak to these number theorists, you get the feeling that for it, for them, that 
the, the only things that are real in mathematics are things that are re related to geometry. Okay, so um, I could talk a long time about this paragraph of Boris, but I want to think about, um, so he also talks about the word-based way, right? This is um, going letter by letter. So if you think about going letter by letter, it kind of acts against this idea of place, right? So there's no whole that you're seeing all at once. It's, it's when going letter by letter, you're, you're drawn into a kind of humdrum temporality, right? Placeness, placeless, right? You're not experiencing a totality. You're going, you're going bit, bit by bit. Um, so, um, uh, so he's, I mean, this idea that, that mathematics has to be at the end of the day, mathematics has to be put into language. It has to be written down. At least that's the professional, professional demand. Okay, I um, next slide. Yeah. So um, this idea of surveyability. I mean, I I finished the paper, and then it was Yoko that reminded me that well, you didn't talk about surveyability. Um, so this is Wittgenstein's notion, and again. Wittgenstein is talking about uh, here, this is the philosophical investigations, right? When I say the proof is a picture, <clears throat> it can be thought of as a cinema, cinematographic picture. So again, this idea of the temp this immediate temporality, <clears throat> we construct the proof once, once and for all. Okay, next slide. And uh, so this is the idea of surveyability. So Juliet Floyd has a beautiful paper on surveyability. But actually, it was this that was at the heart of the foundational programs of the 20th century, right? Because surveyability, what does surveyability give you? It gives you communica communicability, reproducibility, intelligibility, all this, all this uh, you have if you have uh, surveyability. So in a sense, surveyability lies at the heart of Hilbert's foundational enterprise the, the, as long as along with the wider Frege, Russell, Wittgenstein. It's all surveyability. Okay, um, so uh, so that was the paper. I just wanted to tell you about it. Um, it's, it's, of course, I would have liked to have put the sublime to work in a way that cuts more deeply than just calling attention to certain obvious similarities um, between the aesthetics literature and and the impulses that that you see in that in that paragraph of Boris, but um, whatever the philosophical conversation, whatever turns it takes, whatever critical artillery you want to bring philosophical to to Boris's work, in in the end the philosophical conversation will will go back into mathematics, and this is very right talking. Speaking, speaking about philosophical things with a mathematician like Boris, or like you know many of you in the audience, there's a there's a point where the conversation kind of runs out. Is is there another slide? Yeah. So this is um, this is how our conversation ends with Boris kind of all right. I I kind of unbutton myself philosophically, but let's now <laughs> let's now put that away, put that conversation away. So I tried to press them. How, you know, how is it helpful to you in your work to think of the syntax semantics distinction on the way, in the way you do? And he goes back into mathematics. He says, well, look at my, I wrote a paper called the geometric semantics of algebraic quantum mechanics. Look at that. There are other papers on my web page. So, um, so, uh, so that's, um, so that's what uh, it, it ended in a very in a very funny way. So um, so I just tried to what I tried to do in the paper was to look at what Boris said um, against the background of his his work, but also drawing across it this notion of sublimity and this notion of uh, of the, the sort of conflicted 
as aspect of, of sublimity and this idea of taming sublimity through a kind of geometry, um, the possibility of, you know, finding some kind of rapprochement between the words-based way, as, as, as Boris puts it, and the semantical and the semantical uh, and the semantical way. So that's that's the paper. Thank you for listening. Next slide. Are there any questions? I'll start. Um, can you say more about how the mathematical sublime relates to your or to the semantic uh, syntactic distinction? So um, I think the I mean a sort of trivial way. So we have a we have a conflict right in in this idea that. Um, in, in Kant, it's the imagination which is failing to take in the whole. Um, in uh, Girard, this also a failure of the imagination, but then there's this idea of simplicity, um, and then this spline uh, turns into this kind of melancholic notion. And then it uh, it 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 comes to it comes to um, be associated with any mathematical unknown. So in terms of the semantic, I think for for Boris, and we have to see what he what he says about this. But um, I think the domain of sublimity would be on the semantic side, right? That this is something that we you know, um, I mean, content and meaning and truth and so on. This is something we can't get our arms around, right? But we have these syntactic methods. I mean, maybe that's a little bit too facile, but I think that's one way of summarizing it. So you mentioned that the equation, when <clears throat> the equation you mentioned that people couldn't solve finding maximum and minimum. Is there a connection with the dream hypothesis? We cannot decide whether it's true or false. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think this concept of sublimity could absolutely be used all over the place in, in set theory. And, um, you know, it is, it is about a, a kind of failure to resolve a situation, right? And um, so, you know, in, independence in general, I think sublimity. And also in set theory, of course, there's this, you know, tremendous thing, the cumulative hierarchy and the large cardinals and so on. And there's a very clear sense in which this is, uh, this is uh, beyond our ability to, to take in. I mean, even reflection, levy reflection, Right, and he, there's nothing we can say that singles out the whole, the whole thing. Right, anything we say is true on a level. So we like the people who are looking at the volcano. Yeah, in a way, in a way, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's very, you know, it's um, it's a notion. As I said, you don't, you don't see the sublime being discussed so much in the an analytic aesthetics side, right? In analytic aesthetics, what do you do? You try to come up with necessary and sufficient definitions for aesthetic terms. And and question they ask is, you know, the beauty of a theorem, is it in the theorem? Is it in my head? You know, all this kind of thing. I think the people on the continental side, you know, they have a much richer language and they're not afraid to draw on, you know, Freud and Marx and you know all all of this, and uh, so they're much they're much freer. And I think we should also we should take a page out of their book and be be much freer in talking about this uh, this idea of sublimity and this and this idea of conflict, right? Of being attracted but also a little bit afraid. Uh, I think this is very familiar for mathematicians being obsessed with the question not being able to leave it alone, but knowing, right, after maybe 50 years, 
you're not going <laughs> to, but still, you know, there's, there's a kind of compulsion to just return to it again and again. So, so mathematics is, is full of sublimity. Any other questions? If not, we can thank Lydia.